As many of you are undoubtedly aware, Twitter evidence is 100% legitimate, and therefore, this is conclusive proof that Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. So to Drunken Uncle, yippee ki yay motherfucker, which I believe translates from whichever made up language it came from, to fuck you Drunken Uncle. Another thing, yesterday I indicated I've started holding up sarcasm sign. These are an indicator that I'm being intentionally sarcastic, which apparently others have not noticed. So I'm going to restate what I said on my Discord server to those who are busy masturbating to the sound of my voice and not watching what I put on the screen. Might I recommend you watch what I put on the screen, because that way you won't end up making minor mistakes, Mr. Worski. For the subject of today's video, I wanted to focus on Brexit. I know, heavily spoken of subject, but it is coming to an end. The negotiating period that was enacted with Article 50 is coming to an end, and we are coming to a point where everything is open. We don't know what's going to happen. So I want to go through some of the goings on in this current negotiating period, along with some of the possible consequences of it. So as to paint a really, well, scaremongery picture, I'm, I'm very right wing. And if you're one of those masturbating to my voice, I put a sarcasm sign on the screen. Okay. The reason for all of this and why I want to talk about it is simply because during the armistice centenary, there were many discussions and articles published by many media outlets about consequence. I'm not going to scaremonger or imply that they are doing that because I don't care. I'm interested to know the option. I'm interested to know what the government is and is not doing, what the current government's plan of attack is, if at all attack, which, considering how close we are to the deadline, attack might be the best option. But who knows? Perhaps Theresa May has already exhausted that with her threats, possibly, of dancing. Her dancing does contain within it just enough cringe that if left on long enough, people start to cut down the street as opposed to crossing the road. Now, as many of you know, Theresa May has been pushing ahead with what has been called the Chequers Plan, a plan which would see us essentially bound to the EU, but with little to no say on the rules that we have to obey. It would also limit our abilities to trade abroad, internationally, if you will. This is known. It is one of the biggest concessions. Another was the backstop idea to keep Northern Ireland a part of the bloc somewhat. A plan that is not one that can work long term. One that the DUP themselves oppose. The DUP, for those that don't know, are the party, the Northern Irish party, very conservative, that are currently holding the current conservative government in office. It is their seats alone that are doing this. You could say Sinn Féin might have, but they don't go to Westminster. I haven't done for a while either. The Chequers plan has rightly been rejected by the majority of Main Street, including Labour. Labour have openly stated that they will vote against the Chequers plan, or whatever is left of it. And to further support that, I'm going to play a clip of Jeremy Corbyn actually saying this, at the Labour Party conference back in September the 23rd. Labour will vote against the Chequers plan or whatever is left of it and oppose leaving the EU with no deal. And it is inconceivable <laughs> that we should crash out of Europe with no deal. It would be a national disaster. That is why if Parliament votes down a Tory deal or the government fails to reach any deal at all, we would press for a general election. So now you have a bit more context. It's best understood that he opposes this. It's important to note Labour will not back, or Jeremy Corbyn will not back a second referendum because, and again to quote him, this result can no longer be reversed. Emily Thornbury, a part of the Shadow Cabinet, still believes a new referendum is an option. And this comes from her appearing on the Andrew Marsha. And when she was asked about Jeremy Corbyn's comment to a German newspaper that Brexit cannot be stopped. Perhaps Labour would prefer a general election instead, but they could campaign for a people's vote. A people's vote in this context would be on the final deal. This is something many people are pushing for. It is another way to slow the government down, and understandably so, because the current deal as it stands is not leave. It's remain but somebody's tipexed over it. In fact, I would argue that is better than what Theresa May has actually done. Now, since all of that has been going on, there has been some issues with Brexiteer backbenchers in the Conservative Party, and of course, Brexiteer members of her cabinet, and Remainers for that matter. There have been a number of resignations, some brought on by themselves, so I'm not going to include the former Home Secretary in this. 
especially as Amber Rudd brought everything that happened to her on herself. With some of the resignations, you had Boris Johnson who could not abide the Chequers' plan. But Boris, as many know, has a brother. And Boris's brother, Joe, also serves in the cabinet, or did up until a few days ago, when the now former transport minister said he wanted another referendum, saying that what was being offered fell spectacularly short of what had been promised, and he said it would be a democratic travesty to not have another vote. He is one of the many, many MPs calling for a second referendum, something which Theresa May has repeatedly stated will not happen. But she's also stated we leave the customs union, and based on her backstop idea, a compromise would include from a part of the customs union. The point of getting out of the customs union is that we will be leaving the European Union, so we will be coming out of the customs union. As you can tell though, with these divisive people within the cabinet, many would speculate, and rightly so, that many of the issues with progress and negotiations has been stymied by infighting with conservatives, something which I actually support it. I don't mind the fact that they don't agree on everything. I understand that they have to have the nation's interests, but simultaneously, they have to represent the result of the people, which the majority of politicians do not. The majority of big business, the majority of union, do not. It's that academic background. Do I have to put up that sarcasm sign again? Another spanner in the works with what is happening, the fact that we're coming to the end of the negotiating period, is that even though Michel Barnier is supposedly being given more wiggle room to work with us, it is written in the joint agreement that we have to come up with all the solutions, not the EU. Which means even though we're getting closer to the end of it, they don't have to be proactive in the slightest. Even though it has been said by many economists that the EU would be in budget deficit of around 250 million in research funding and collaboration on new projects. In addition to that, it could also cost the economy of the EU, that is 100 billion. Now let's face it, many would say no deal is never going to happen. But as we're getting closer, there is no indication that we are in fact going to get certainly one that benefits both countries. And yes, I said country. Others have pointed out that no deal would harm investment, rightly so. Others have pointed out it would harm pensions. Well, we have an ageing nation and the pension is getting bigger, so perhaps the idea of a purge isn't such a bad idea. Sarcasm all aside, and moving on from the severity of what could happen with no deal, which we'll get to in a moment, there was one other spanner in the works in the form of Jacob Rees-Mock, who has been quite vocal on Twitter, and up until now has not been very vocal in offering any compromise to the situation. Many have said he is the perfect replacement to Theresa May because he himself is a Brexiteer. Therefore, he would represent what the people voted for. He also supported Joe Johnson's right to resign, quotes, over the withdrawal agreement, which does not deliver on the referendum, but creates a vassal state, a term which is being used by many. Some have merely fobbed it off and said that's not the case. Unfortunately, terms we are currently operating under would make us a vassal state. Jacob Rees-Mogg has also been outspoken recently, especially when it came to the customs union extension, which he has in a Twitter video stated he will vote against it. If there is an extension to the customs union, I will vote against it because it denies what the Prime Minister herself has said and has promised, and I expect the Prime Minister to deliver on her promises. And what is your sense of how many of your colleagues feel the same as you? I, I think the people who are not happy with this approach um, is a significant number. Many dozen. This has been supported by many other people who do not support the current motives of the government to push ahead with the Chequers plan. Now, Jacob Rees-Mogg has in fact offered a solution, a, quotes, Brexiteer compromise to achieve a quick and clean break, where he has been quoted as saying in an article in the Daily Mail that he himself wrote, let's leave the EU as friends by giving them 20 billion. And I'm going to read a few passages from this, because it is quite relevant. Theresa May will understandably be dismayed by his resignation, that of Boris's brother, Joe Johnson, and by new reports that, in any case, there could be no progress this week preferred check a solution, as Brussels will not accept it, something everyone knew, or may have known. Michel Barnier gave a speech recently to the EU. Most of them phoned if they took selfies, and Merkel even left halfway through. Clearly, he was riveting. However, it is time for the Prime Minister to be true to her mantra that no deal is better than a bad deal. It is also time for convinced Brexiteers like me to compromise. So at this late hour in the negotiations, we would like to make a new, generous offer to break the deadlock to achieve a no deal plus. It would cost us money, but it would finally dispel the crash-out, project-fear-nightmare scenario. It is true that with no withdrawal agreement at all, 
we legally owe the EU nothing, despite misguided claims from the Chancellor that we do. In the joint report agreement, they'd agree that we would pay sums of money, but that was only contingent on us agreeing a deal when we left. Therefore, our obligations are null and void because of the joint report. But we should offer Brussels £20 billion to make our departure as amicable as possible. Under it, we would leave on schedule on March the 29th, 2019. However, for a 21-month transition period, until the end of 2020, both sides would maintain a standstill, with zero tariffs on either goods and no additional barriers. This would be until the end of the EU's current multi-annual financial framework. In return, the UK would continue to make payments to the EU budget, which are just under £10 billion a year net. In total, that is half what the government is currently prepared to pay for a deal. We would continue to apply existing EU rules and the common commercial policy until the end of 2020. In short, the UK would be a third country which would simplify the negotiations. And just to finish up on the customs union related elements, there is also the even more important issue of the customs union remaining in it is proposed as the backstop plan in case nothing else could. However, it would prevent us from cutting tariffs, denying the nation one of Brexit's major benefits. It would hit the least well-off the most by the price of food, clothing and footwear higher than necessary to protect inefficient continental businesses. The UK would also be prevented from making trade deals with other nations. It would also leave us more tied into EU's customs union than we are today. I think he sums up many people's fear. So to finish up, I want to go through some of the consequences of what would happen with a no deal that is referenced on iNews, where some of the topics include trade, where the UK would revert to World Trade Organization rules on trade. But as we all know, issues with tariffs would arise because of how the EU operates, and this would obviously create additional issues with barriers. The people would be free to set its own controls on immigration by EU nationals, and the bloc could do the same for Britons. The fate, though, of expats, where there are 1.3 million Britain new countries and 3.7 million Europeans in Britain, would be unclear. Laws, well, the majority of EU laws that we don't have implemented in our country, would come back to us so we could either enshrine it in our own or not. We would also no longer be adhering to the rules of the European Court of Justice, but it would be bound to the European Court on Human Rights, as that is a new body. Money. The government would not have to pay the annual £13 billion contribution to the EU budget, but we would lose out on some of the EU subsidies, which would include the Common Agricultural Policy, which gives £3 billion to farmers. And one of the biggest ones, the Irish board. I've already given up a solution. Give us Ireland and we'll give you Scotland. Before I finish, do I need to put the sarcasm sign up again? Seriously. Anyway, I hope everyone has a lovely Monday, and thank you all for listening.